I don't have a formal presentation. I would like to briefly kind of go over some things on diabetes and then we'll just kind of have a free for all here questions. I'm going to be absolutely truthful with you. Some of the questions sometimes I don't have the answer. So either I'll make up something for you or I'll tell you, you know, go check it up someplace else. Uh, just whatever you do, don't Google it. Um, obviously you're here because you either have diabetes, you know someone who has diabetes, so you have a you know, vested interest in knowing about diabetes, so you're a health professional. So I'm not going to go into very, very basics, but I think it's important to just kind of review some of the basics. Sometimes I think we get caught up on the advances and we forget to review, you know, what are the types of diabetes? How do we classify people? And sometimes there's a lot of misconceptions about, you know, who is what category and what you do with them. I think my biggest pet peeve, well, actually two biggest pet peeves and probably Luann and, and um, Patrick can tell you, don't say the word borderline in my presence. I may actually slap you. <laughs> it is not nice. Um, Pre-diabetes, fine, I'll accept that metabolic syndrome, but borderline, in my opinion, gives people this false sense of security. It's not really a problem yet. We're getting to a problem, but not quite there. And that's, unfortunately, the worst thing you can do at that stage of your disease is at the time that you want to really become very aggressive at treating it, and you're just sort of pretending it's not there. Um, when you call it pre-diabetes, I think it just says the word diabetes in there, it catches your attention, it makes you think a little bit more about it. So, you know, again, you're, if you're not quite a diabetic yet, you're a pre-diabetic, either that or you're completely normal, and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, unless you have a family history and then you still have to worry about it and you need to screen. Finding diabetes early is absolutely where we need to work a lot more. There are currently probably somewhere between 25 and 30 million people with documented di uh, diagnosed diabetes in the United States. Unfortunately, there's probably another 25 million out there who have diabetes and don't know it. And those are the people who can get into the worst complications before they even have a chance to treat it. I think we have done a lot of improvement in that respect. We have actually made progress because of the awareness about prediabetes. Um, you know, even the old physicians who used to call borderline sugar uh, 190 fasting are actually ca catching on that, you know, that's not quite borderline anything. Um, you know, it's like I used to say borderline dead and I realized some people are borderline dead, so I use <laughs> borderline pregnant now because that's, that's clearer. Um, the key is, again, find it early. Think about it. Um, how many of you, all of you have diabetes in, in this? Okay. Well, I, you know, I cannot expect it, the majority of you. You already know it. That's wonderful. You're taking care of it. You're trying to learn about it. The people who need to really become more aware is your descendants, your children, your grandchildren, your siblings. Uh, particularly if you have younger siblings. Um, diabetic particularly, diabetes particularly, type 2 diabetes is a very genetically um, uh, motivated disease. Uh, now we are seeing a lot of diabetes that is mainly related to weight gain. So, you know, some of those patients don't have family history. And those are the ones that you read about in the newspaper, you know, the miracle cure for diabetes is bariatric surgery. It is if you have um, you know, weight-induced diabetes. If you have genetics for diabetes, unfortunately, you may postpone it, you may improve it, you may treat it well with the weight loss, but you're still going to have the genetics. You, at this point, 2012, we cannot modify genetics. That may change in the future, it's a possibility, but as of now, we cannot modify that. It's never too early to teach children to eat better. It's never too early to start teaching them to be careful about the possibility of developing diabetes later on. The fastest growing group of type 2 diabetics right now are the children and young adolescents. And it is scary because pediatricians are not really well trained on treating type 2 diabetes, which is what these children have. They're not your typical type 1 
you know, happen out of the blue diabetes, there are your type 2 diabetes uh, patients happening at a younger and younger age. Um, concern of that is, of course, the high prevalence of coronary artery disease, cardiovascular problems in type 2 diabetics that we're going to see very young in these people. Um, and again, if you see the rise of the incidence of type 2 diabetes parallels the rise of the weight in the general population. You can pretty much draw the same curve for both of them, the obesity epidemic and the diabetes type 2 epidemics. And I'm mainly going to be referring to type 2 because probably most people in this audience have type 2, although I'm sure some of you have type 1. Type 1 diabetes, the incidence hasn't really gone up as much. It's always kind of been fairly steady. It's, you know, 10% of the diabetics are type 1. And type 1s are an autoimmune type of disorder. Something triggers an autoimmune reaction that attacks the pancreas cells that produce insulin and destroys them most of the time, quite rapidly. Uh, people with type 1 diabetes require insulin injections very quickly. Uh, it's a matter of weeks or months between the onset of symptoms and being in the hospital getting insulin intravenously before you get to meet uh, Luann and Kelly or Patrick and they teach you how to do insulin shots. I think one of the common misunderstandings that I find in my practice is people assume that if you're on insulin, you're a type 1. And that is not always the case. All of the type 1s are on insulin, but a lot of type 2s are on insulin as well. And I sometimes tell my, tell my patients, particularly the younger ones, at this point, if you live long enough, you're going to be on insulin. Diabetes is a progressive disorder. It's not that you're a failure, it's not that your doctor is a failure, it's that your pancreas fails. And you're so insulin resistant with type 2 diabetes that you require more and more and more insulin, and that little pancreas can only push so hard, and then it finally gives up the ghost. And being on insulin, again, does not mean you suddenly become a type 1. You're insulin requiring, which is not the same as being insulin dependent. Type 1 diabetics are insulin dependent. And what, that, what is the difference? I mean, doesn't it sound the same? Not really. If you're insulin dependent, if you're truly a type 1, without insulin, you will deteriorate very rapidly and will die in a fairly short period of time. Without insulin, if you're a type 2 and you are requiring insulin, you're going to have horrible blood sugars for years and years and developing every possible complication of type 2 diabetes, uh, but are not going to die very rapidly unless something else happens that really kind of deteriorates you very quickly. So you can go for years without insulin, just horribly controlled. And unfortunately, that does a lot of damage. Another common misconception that I see is that insulin should be the last resort. You know, when everything else fails, then you take insulin, and you have to postpone that for as long as you can. And once you're on insulin, you might as well be dead because that's what, what's going to happen anyways. And unfortunately, that is exactly the opposite. Sometimes postponing insulin for too long is what causes you to get in trouble. Insulin should be used a lot sooner than we're seeing it used. Sometimes insulin should be the first thing that we use trying to get you under control, and then, you know, put your oral agents if it's appropriate. So it, again, once you're on insulin, doesn't mean you're on insulin forever unless you have type 1 diabetes, but don't fight going on insulin if you need to, because it's only going to do more harm to yourself. Once you have the complications, none of the complications can be reversed. Sure, you can do laser to the retina and stop the bleeding. You can go on dialysis and keep living, but that doesn't make your kidneys function again. You're stuck on dialysis or transplant if you can get it. Once you have an amputation, you can get this lovely prosthesis, but there's still a prosthesis. So you cannot reverse the complications. One thing also you want to remember, um, you want to know, I always tell people, you need to know your ABCs. And I don't mean you need to know how to read and write. You need to know your A1C level. You need to know the numbers. You need to know what your goal is. 
You know, is an A1C of 15 okay? No, it's not. But what is your goal? Is your goal 10? Is your goal 7? Is your goal 6.2? And that kind of has to be determined between you and your physician, depending on your age, your other illnesses as well. The recommendation for older people has changed recently. For years, we were pushing for less than 6.5 for everybody. Well, that's wonderful for the younger population, and by younger, I mean less than 65, less than 70. The older I get, the younger the population gets, too. But if you are in your 70s or 80s and you have heart disease, to get to an A1C of less than 6.5 usually requires some hypoglycemia, some low sugars here and there that may be a little too risky for someone in that age group with a heart condition already. So you may see that, you know, some time ago your doctor was telling you, well, you have to get that A1C below, it's 6.8 and it needs to be 6.2. And now they may say, well, you're seven, you know, 6.9 and you're doing fine. And that's because the recommendation has changed a little bit. Eight is never acceptable unless, you know, you have so many intolerances of medications that you just can't get below that. So you want to be, you know, if you're over 65 or over 70 at least, between 6.5 and 7 or between 6.5 and 7.2, 7.3 is a good range. You're in a safe range. If you're a young person with diabetes, the 6.5 or less still applies. A young woman who is planning a pregnancy needs to be around 6 to have the best results for that pregnancy. Uh, pregnancies can be successful in type 1 diabetics or even in type 2s, uh, but it, they require a lot of work. It has to be a very motivated person. However, I find that those are my best patients. You can ask a pregnant woman to stand on her head and jump on one hand only, and they will do it when they deliver the baby or back to square one. But you know, a, a woman who really is trying to get pregnant and becomes pregnant will become the best patient ever because they're really so highly motivated. And they do you know, 22 finger sticks a day if you ask them, and they send the blood sugar readings every other day, and they do a wonderful job. Sometimes it's wonderful to see after they have the baby, they realize when they put a little effort into it, they do so well, and then it motivates them to continue that afterwards. But don't forget, you, you're dealing mostly as a general population with two types of diabetes. Type 1, which is about 10% of the diabetic population, vast majority of patients have type 2s. Type 2s are living longer and longer because the population is aging, so they're developing the complications just as much as the type 1s. Good control makes a world of difference, but good control of only your blood sugar does not get you to go, and that's where the B comes. You need to get a good control of your blood pressure. And again, you need to know what your blood pressure number is. You need to reach at least the general population goal of less than 130 over 80. In diabetics, we prefer it less than 120 over 80. Again, these are guidelines. If you have an older person who cannot tolerate a blood pressure that low because they get lightheaded, dizzy, and they fall, all bets are off. But as a general rule, is your goal is to get to 120 over 80 or less, or at least less than 130 over 80. And the C of the ABCs is your cholesterol. You need to know what your cholesterol is and try to get it to goal. Unfortunately, when you put all the ABCs together, what does that mean? That means you're going to be on a whole bunch of medication. And that's where sometimes we get the, you know, the pushback from patients. Well, you know, why do I have to take cholesterol medication and blood pressure medication and blood sugar pills and do my finger sticks and you know how much this is costing me and you know, you know the story. Unfortunately, that's the only way that you're going to have a healthy life. Yes, you're going to have to do all this work, but you're going to be able to live your long years in better health than if you don't. And believe me, you know, it's Fine and dandy to have an A1C of 6.2, but when you have that stroke because your blood pressure was 160 over 100, it's of, it's of no benefit to you to have that good blood sugar control when you ignore your blood pressure altogether. Or have a wonderful blood pressure, but you ignore your cholesterol and then you have a heart attack. 
uh, or you have a block, uh, blockage in your leg and you end up with a, a bypass or an amputation. So you have to keep in mind that you have to keep an eye on all of your body, not just this one little part. All of it is important and all of it affects each other. And when you look at the cholesterol, you want to keep it as low as possible. Diabetics have a much more atherogenic cholesterol, meaning it blocks the blood vessels a lot more than people without diabetes. It's a, it's a denser cholesterol that sticks to the blood vessels like super glue. So, you know, a non-diabetic LDL of 130 may be okay, but for a diabetic, that's way too high. You can have a MI with a 125 LDL, which is the bad cholesterol. The higher your good cholesterol, your L HDL, the best. And, you know, you can do a lot with medications to lower your bad cholesterol, but increasing your good cholesterol is a little bit tougher. It's a lot harder to get it to increase, and your best thing for that is exercise. So, you know, any kind of exercise you can get, even if it's just walking up and down the hall in the retirement home, that's fine. Um, you just try to get at least, you know, enough to get your heart rate um, a little bit uh, um, increased. There are some un unusual types of diabetes that we call secondary diabetes related to other disorders such as growth hormone excess called acromegaly, Cushing's disease, which is excess cortisol. Um, similar to, the, to that is people who have to take steroids for other medical conditions such as asthma, rheumatoid arthritis. You know, people who have ever been on prednisone who have diabetes know what that means. It makes your sugars shoot through the roof is a very quick increase in your sugars. Other than the steroid-induced high sugars, the other medical conditions are extremely rare. So if, when we diagnose someone with diabetes, we don't go looking for acromegaly and Cushing's disease unless they have other features of that. It's not really necessary, nor is it cost-effective, really. Um, there are some even more unusual uh, forms of um, secondary diabetes that you know, I'm not even going to go into because they're almost unheard of, uh, some weird disorders of metabolism. I cannot stress enough how important your involvement is in the control of your own diabetes. It's no different than any other disease, to be honest with you. However, it requires more commitment, more time commitment. Um, you know, you, you're pregnant, you go have a baby, you obviously have a guy, an obstetrician there with you who's helping you through the steps of labor, but who does the pushing? You do. At least the women in the audience know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, the obstetrician can't do the pushing for you. The obstetrician can't do the checkups, uh, you know, go to the checkups at your house. You have to go to his office. And it's no different with diabetes. The difference is, you know, nine months your pregnancy is over, diabetes is here to stay. But you have to remember we can give you guidelines, we can give you suggestions, we can give you recommendations, we can't do it for you. You have to put the effort into your monitoring, your timing of medications with re respects to the meals, making sure that your meals are properly balanced, and I'm not going to go through all of that, you know, because I'm sure Luann and Patrick have covered that already, but I know it becomes after a while, a big chore, and you get disgusted of having diabetes, and you want it to go away, but it doesn't. So ignoring it and sticking the head on the sand is not the best approach. I find, you know, in my practice, we have a lot of patients send their blood sugars in, either faxing them or emailing them, and in the old days, we used to have people call them in, but it took too much time for my nurse to write them down, so we kind of eliminated that. And I, the reason we do that is, for two reasons. Number one, yes, we can make adjustments on medication in between visits, but I really find that it motivates people a lot. And we're all the same, you know, we all want to be good. We want to please people. We want to please our parents, our teachers, you know, most of the time. Um, so when people know that they have to report their blood sugars, they're kind of watching their diet a little better, and they're behaving themselves a little better because they have to, you know, let Dr. Berman know that their sugar is, you know, 350 and they have to give an explanation. And it's amazing. I mean, people actually will tell me, you know, I went out to dinner with my friends and I had a couple of drinks and a piece of pie, you know. So I know that I don't need to change the medication. So even if you're seeing your primary care for your uh, diabetic care, which is fine, 
make sure you take your glucometer logbook with you. You know, I have a, a, the programs in the office that we can just hook up a monitor and download it, but the primary care office may not have that. Just take your glucometer readings, you know, jot them down in a little logbook, that, the little diary that comes with a monitor, or buy a little notebook or whatever. And it's not a bad idea to even do that for yourselves. When you write them down and you put them in columns, you know, you do the fasting sugar in the morning, your dinner sugar, your bedtime sugar, whatever times of the day you do, you put them in columns and it brings out a pattern. You can see, oh gee, you know, I'm always high at this time of the day. I, between lunch and dinner, something happens and then you can start pinning down the causes of that. Are you not getting enough insulin at lunch if you're on insulin? Are you taking your pills at the wrong time of the day? Is lunch always a meal out? Are you eating out at lunch because you work and you don't pack your lunch? And that could help determine what you need to do for your treatment. Um, you know, if you're, every night you're going to bed with a blood sugar of 80, gee, you know, maybe we need to modify that a little bit so you don't pass out in the middle of the night. Um, so it does help you do it for yourselves, but take it with you to your doctor's appointment and just have them take a quick glance or have the nurse take a quick glance and, you know, show them, these are my readings for the last couple of months. What do you think? You should make appointments for checkups on a regular basis. That's the other thing. As a diabetic, you do not want to see your doctor just when you're sick. That means trouble because, number one, you have no idea what happens in between. If you're one of the lucky ones that doesn't get sick, you may not see your family doctor for a year and a half. So that is not a good enough trend. You should be, if you're under very good control, you should see someone every six months. If you're not controlled, it should be every three to four months or even more often if you're really in trouble. So you need to make those appointments on a regular basis, not wait until you're sick to call your family doctor or, you know, if you see an endocrinologist, they're gonna make you make an appointment regardless. But uh, it is important to keep those appointments. One of the complaints I get from my patient is if they have to cancel an appointment, it may take them four months to reschedule. Well, I'm sorry, there's one of me, a bazillion of you. So unfortunately, there's too few endocrinologists for the increase on the incidence of diabetes. A, we cannot see every diabetic. It will be humanly impossible. So the primary care doctors will need to take care of a lot of the diabetics who are fairly well controlled. But if, again, if somebody has to cancel an appointment, I understand, you know, sometimes things happen, but the schedule is what it is. So sometimes, you know, unless something comes up that it truly is, you know, important, wh whatever endocrinologist you see, trust me, all, all of our schedules are the same. Um, when you look at the number of people in the North Hills alone, and we have how many endocrinologists? About four in this area. And, you know, two of them are in my office. So you, you can see it's not a lot of, uh, a lot of us available. Um, things are probably going to get worse before they get better. Fewer people are going into endocrinology uh, for multiple reasons. And people are living longer and longer, so there are more and more diabetics. And those diabetics have children who eventually become diabetics and who have children who become diabetics. So it's an exponential growth. I actually have two or three generations of you know, people in my practice that I see the entire family. I see the grandmother's daughter and the granddaughter or grandson or whatever. So in, you know, once again, that is why it's so important to be very, very aggressive at taking care of yourself, but also to know what that means, to know what to expect and to know what to ask for. Um, if you don't speak up, sometimes you don't get the proper care. You need to be, you know, an advocate for yourselves or for your families if you have, you know, elderly parents who just feel uncomfortable asking for, you know, I, it's been six months since I have my A1C check. Shouldn't I have one of those done? Please help them, you know, speak up at their doctor's appointments and make sure that they keep those appointments. Sometimes we have to make sure they have transportation to those appointments. So uh, it becomes a little complicated, I know, but it is absolutely essential that you do that. 
I don't want to speak forever and ever, so um, I'm going to have you um, do questions uh, um, if, you, if you wish. If you could um, kind of raise your hand so Patrick can kind of bring a, mon a microphone to you, otherwise we probably won't hear uh, either the question or the answer. Uh, see? <laughs> I'm a third generation diabetic, mm -hmm. and you mentioned children and grandchildren. How often, which test, how often and all should I recommend to them to be tested? What kind of test and how often okay. and when? Um, you said, I'm sorry, you said you're first generation? I'm third generation. Third generation, okay. Um, because of that, I would recommend your, probably your children should be started to check a, a fasting blood sugar and an A1C ideally at 25, and if they're normal, maybe every three to four years, you may run into a problem with coverage with insurances. Uh, they will cover a fasting blood sugar. A1C, even though it is the recommendation by every society in the country, um, you have to have a diagnosis that goes with it. Well, how can you have a diagnosis for a screening test that kind of is you know, an oxymoron? Then it's no longer a screening test, it's a diagnostic test. Um, having a strong family history should be an, in, you know, an indication, definitely after 40. You know. But again, because we're seeing it younger and younger, it's, it's really a good idea to start at least with a baseline at 25. Children is another story. You do not want to do screening tests, blood tests in children. It's too traumatic for them. Just make you know, the pediatrician aware that there is a family history. And if there are any suspicion, they can then test them. But just doing you know, blood tests every year on children is just too traumatic. And it, it doesn't really help. The best thing, though, is prevention. Again, you know, screening tests are wonderful, but they catch problems. The, the idea is to prevent the problems from developing in the first place. And those children and grandchildren, the best legacy you can leave them is a good education and eating, good eating habits, good activity level, and making sure they know that they need their checkups. There is a reason for physical exams every year or every couple of years, depending on the age group. That way they can really become very, very aware of the, of the condition ahead. When, when do you decide to go to endocrinologist as opposed to going to internal medicine doctor for treatment of diabetes? Uh, I'm a diabetic. I don't know if Shreya goes come <laughs> see you. Or uh, it, it, it's going to be a little bit of a biased answer, obviously. Okay. Again, you know, with the understanding that we cannot see all of the diabetics. So I guess the answer is if you're well controlled, you know, your A1C is less than seven with whatever you're doing with your primary care, as long as you see that primary care on a very consistent schedule, there's really no reason to go see an endocrinologist because an endocrinologist will not tell you to do anything much differently. Someone who has had an A1C of nine or 8.5 or nine, repeatedly over several checks and nothing is being done then or nothing is working, that's when you need to kind of think maybe it's time to go see a specialist um, because, you know, if you're not making progress. Now, again, when you look at an A1C, that's a, a test that takes three or four months to change. So you can't see, you know, an A1C of 9.7 and the next month is 9.3 and you say, oh my gosh, it's not working. Well, you haven't given it enough time, but, you know, three checks in a row is still not a goal and nothing is either being changed or the changes are not helping, then it's probably time to think about a, a specialist, at least a consult, just to see if, you know, a program can be developed. Well, again, it depends. If you're a goal, yeah, if you're control of metformin alone, just, you know, stay on metformin alone. That's a medication you can take, you know, forever or until you're 80, one or whatever comes first. Uh, after 80, is not advisable, but it's not as written in stone either. Um, you know, if you have an 80-year-old who is very 
in good, very good shape and has perfectly normal kidney function and you're monitoring them very closely, you can continue metformin cautiously for a little bit longer. But 80, you start to kind of raise a red flag, metformin is probably not the best choice. But as long as you're doing well, you're obviously not anywhere near 80, um, there's no need to add anything else unless you start to see the sugars creep up. The problem is in metformin, the question was, what's the problem with metformin after 80, in case it's sighted and catch it? It's not that metformin is a problem. The problem is after 80, just about everybody's kidney function declines a little bit. You know, as we get older, we all wear out. If you have kidney disorder for any reason, whether you're 80 or you're 72 or, or 52 and you had kidney failure, Metformin can become toxic because it's excreted through the kidney and you can get rid of it. And it can lead to a condition called lactic acidosis, which can be life-threatening. Um, if you develop lactic acidosis, 50% of those patients die, even with treatment. So that is the reason why metformin has to be held anytime you have intravenous contrast, like if you have a CAT scan or, or if you have surgery. Um, you have to hold it for two days after the surgery. The anesthesiologists prefer you hold it the day before as well. The idea of that is those are conditions that can suddenly deteriorate your kidneys. You can go into acute kidney insufficiency from intravenous contrast or from surgical procedures. 48 hours later, if your kidneys are still fine, then you're okay to start it. But that's the reason why. It's, I think, again, there's a misconception that metformin causes kidney disease. It's not the case. Kidney disease causes metformin to become potentially toxic. Hi. It's, it's on. <laughs> I actually have two questions. One is related to the obesity comment. Is, is there an increased risk with diabetes with any eating disorder, including like anorexia or bulimia? Well, again, it, it depends on in anorexia when they're losing a lot of weight is not directly related to type 2 diabetes. They can have other hormonal imbalances, but not type 2. Bulimic who get the you know, increase in the weight and the loss and the increase in loss, that unfortunately can increase the risk, particularly during their periods of, of excess weight. Um, you, know, you have to remember there is a, if you look at your BMI, BMI, your body mass index, which is the weight with relation to your height as an indicator for your weight, up to 25 is normal. From 25 to 30 is considered overweight. And your risk for diabetes starts to increase at that point. The higher your BMI, the higher, the more risk you have. Once you hit 30 or above and you, you're in the obesity range, um, the risk get, rise, rises exponentially. I mean, it's just huge increases in, in diabetes. And unfortunately, you know, with our lifestyle, we have seen such a tremendous increase in weight, again, not only in adults, but in children. Um, there have been some good changes being made. I mean, there was a, a news article the other day about how children were complaining, I forget where, about the healthy lunches. They were not getting enough food. And, and actually, the calories were the same. It was, you know, it, they were healthier foods, and I bet you they were not eating all of them. That's, you know, they were not eating their salad, they were not eating their fruit, and of course they were hungry halfway through the afternoon because they didn't finish their lunch. It was nothing wrong with the lunch. It was just kids are not used to eating good food. They're used to eating the junk. Uh, and unfortunately, we've created a whole you know, generation who thinks that ketchup is a vegetable. And, you know, and, and the lettuce on their hamburger is, constitute the vegetable for the day. So, but it, it, you know, to your to your point, yeah, it can with bulimia. You can see, unfortunately, glucose intolerance at least with a high weight. And my second question is kind of related to is other hormone imbalances that might be related to the diabetes in aging women or estrogen, um, and other recommendations that you might have for other tests <laughs> that might be related. Well, again, I mean, you have to look. First of all, as you're looking at aging women, I'm assuming you're talking postmenopausal women, so estrogen is no longer a factor. Lack of estrogen is uh, a potential increase in weight. I mean, menopausal women gain weight, and it's not a myth. 
some more than others, no question about it. But it is it is very easily seen. Uh, you know, women go through menopause a year later; they're ten pounds heavier, um, and it's very hard to lose the weight after menopause. Uh, again, there are other hormonal issues that can cause secondary diabetes. But you know, it, going back to what I mentioned earlier, if I see a newly diagnosed diabetic, I don't check their growth hormone and I don't check their cortisol levels unless I suspect they have acromegaly, and there is a very characteristic feature to these people. They have very large hands. Their ring size has gone up three times in the last year. They went from a size whatever shoe to two sizes bigger. Their forehead all of a sudden is protruding. Their noses get wider. So it's not exactly your average person. Um, so checking their growth hormone on everybody is not necessary. And it's in a very expensive test. You're talking about you know two, three hundred dollars for a lousy blood test, and it gives you the yield of zero. So again, and I have that happen sometimes in my practice. Shouldn't you check this? Shouldn't you check that? Because you read it in the internet, or Oprah was talking about it. Well, um, you know, again, unfortunately, yes. I mean, if you want to be a hundred percent, you know, academic about it, sure, you check everything under the sun. Realistically, can we do that? No. There is not enough money in any insurance company, no matter how many you know, it, times they increase your premium, to pay for everybody who has diabetes to be checked for all of those weird conditions. You know, where do you draw the line? Do you do chromosomal analysis in all of them to see if they have you know, Turner syndrome? You can't. It's just too costly. You have to pick the patient who fits some other criteria. Uh, once a patient who is diabetic has had pancreatitis, mm -hmm. is that patient ever considered a candidate for pill treatment as opposed to insulin, or is it always going to be insulin from that point on? That's a great question, actually, uh, because pancreatitis is a relatively common condition. Um, pancreatitis is an inflammation of the pancreas. The pancreas is the organ where your insulin comes from. So it's very common during an acute attack of pancreatitis to see the blood sugars go up very, very high. The pancreas, though, is a kind of a mixed gland. It's a mixed organ. Um, some of the cells, the islet cells, the beta cells, produce the insulin, but a large portion of the pancreas produces the digestive enzymes. So it has two different functions. The pancreatitis affects more the digestive side of the pancreas. And you can lose a lot of pancreas tissue and still be able to make enough insulin to remain normal. Sometimes they just lose a little bit more and they have difficulty at home controlling the sugars. You can use oral agents on those patients if their sugars are not terribly high, if they're running you know, 150s, 160s, 170s, particularly things that don't necessarily affect the pancreas directly, like metformin. Metformin does not affect your insulin production. As a matter of fact, it actually protects your insulin production. So yeah, I mean, it, again, it depends on the case. Some people who have multiple attacks of pancreatitis, their pancreas, unfortunately, are destroyed beyond health, and they become insulin dependent. But a lot of those patients actually do well with pills for a while, for several years. Not acutely, not in the hospital. You know. And, by the way, everybody who has diabetes who comes into the hospital, unless it's a you know, removal of a wart, is going to need insulin most likely because you know, our tolerance for high sugars in the hospital is extremely low and it should be. The higher your sugar when you're in the hospital for any reason, the longer you're going to be in the hospital because you're more likely to have complications. So you know, expect that when you come into the hospital, they're going to do finger sticks and you're going to get stuck with insulin. And it's no big deal. It doesn't mean you're going home on insulin. It means you need it now. And the pancreatitis patients, almost all of them end up with insulin temporarily. And then again, it, depending on how much damage they have had. I'm an 80-year-old RN who's moved here from the state of Indiana. And I want to, first of all, compliment Pittsburgh at the wonderful medical care we have here. It is outstanding, people. I am so happy to be here. Secondly, at the recommendation of my primary physician, 
Dr. Berkman, I'm going to see you in your office on December 6th. Okay. And you he made that won. appointment three years ago? No, no. I see him. I saw him recently, and I'm under control. But he wanted me to have an endocrinologist, and I said, I want the best in the area. You got the call. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, while I'm there, I'm going to ask you, is this possible? Is there any kind of a test that will check my insulin levels? Can uh, I ask for this test? Are you on insulin or not? Uh, no, not my insulin. My, um, yeah, my insulin. My well, body. yeah, but I mean, are you, I, are you injecting insulin? insulin? No, yeah. I'm on metformin. Okay. If you're not on insulin shots, you can do, and even if you are on insulin shot, but it's not as accurate, you can do a test called C-peptide. Okay. Um, that is an, um, an, a measurement, an indirect measurement of, of production of insulin by the pancreas. Insulin is produced in the pancreas, which is about this area. It has a direct circulation to the liver. It's called the portal circulation. So it doesn't hit the general circulation before it hits the liver. The liver uses up 50% of the insulin before it hits the rest of the circulation. So drawing an insulin level is not as accurate as drawing a C-peptide. C-peptide is a product of degradation of insulin, so it's a better, more accurate test. However, one thing that people need to realize is it does, when you have type 2 diabetes, you are insulin resistant. So your insulin production may actually be higher than normal. But if your blood sugars are high, that insulin is, is ineffective. So it doesn't matter, unfortunately, whether you're able to make a little, a lot, or a huge amount of insulin if it's not working. So it doesn't make it necessarily, it doesn't help determine what treatment you need. Um, you, you treat a base, the treatment is based on your blood sugar and on your A1C and your other medical conditions. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, your insurance will likely not pay for the C-peptide because it's not considered medically necessary. Unless like you want to have an insulin pump and then they will insist on a C-peptide, no, which need, is a stupid thing. My, my, <laughs> My blood sugars have been good. I'm just wondering right. if, you know, if I can go off the metformin since you tell me how dangerous it is well, at age 80, uh, which will be me. Right. Again, it will need to be determined based on your kidney function. However, let's, for the sake of argument, say you're 60 instead of 80. My recommendation will be absolutely do not stop metformin. It can prolong the life of your pancreas and prevent you from deteriorating. At 80, yeah, you may need to have that looked at, but the, the true answer is yes, you may need to come off of metformin, but you may need to go on something else in its place. Okay. Otherwise, you'll slide backwards. I'll see you in December. Sounds good. <laughs> Okay. The question is what determines whether you use insulin injections or an insulin pump? And the quickest answer is convenience. Uh, for a lot of people, you know, their schedule is crazy, they work shifts or they work unpredictable hours or they don't want to be carrying all these bags with them. An insulin pump is an insulin delivery system. It doesn't take care of your diabetes, it just helps you, you know, push a couple of buttons and you get your injection. Um, it does have some additional benefits. Insulin pumps do have other benefits, such as allowing you to adjust the insulin in much smaller increments. And that's very important for type 1 diabetics because they're very insulin sensitive. Type 2 diabetics, not so much because you should increase your insulin by, you know, four, five, six units at the time. Diabetics sometimes need a half a unit increases or a third of a unit increase, and you can't do that with syringes. So, but, you know, one of the things that also you have to understand with an insulin pump. It, it does not mean you stick this pump in yourself and you go about your life forgetting that you have diabetes. That's not how it works. It requires actually quite a bit of work. And, you know, people who come to my office expecting to walk out of there with an insulin pump prescription and have no blood work for the last year, they don't even know what brand glucometer they're using, they have never seen a dietitian. I'm not going to walk out of my office ever with an insulin pump. You need to do your homework first. Insulin pump is like a computer, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't put the right information in, it gives you the wrong amount of insulin.
Uh, you were mentioning about the type 1 diabetes possibly being autoimmune. Could you just expand on that? And do we still use the term brittle diabetic? Um, let, me, let me address the autoimmune part first. Autoimmune disease means your body attacks parts of itself. Um, other examples of autoimmune diseases that you may have heard of are lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Graves' disease, which is a thyroid condition, vitiligo, people who have the loss of um, skin pigment, you know, the people who have those patches of discolored skin, that's an autoimmune disease. The problem with autoimmune disorders is, if we're really honest, we have no idea what the heck triggers them. What causes this person to become a type 1 diabetic after chicken pox, and then you have 200,000 children have chicken pox and not a single one of them becomes a diabetic. Um, there is a little bit of a genetic tendency. There are some familial clusters of type 1 diabetes. And as a matter of fact, Allegheny County has a fairly high number of clusters in families. We tell people, you know, if you have type 2 diabetes, it's much more genetic, and it's true. However, you see these families where the mother has it, all of the children have it, the siblings have it. I have personally several families. I have one of my patients diagnosed his own brother, you know, his young kid, I mean, 20 some year olds. Um, you know, my patient was talking to his brother, his brother saying, gee, you know, I can't get enough water and I'm going to the bathroom all the time and I just feel crappy and he took a finger stick and he was 400 and something. Um, so there is some genetic component as well to type one that makes them predisposed to something else than triggers this autoimmune response. Most, many times you see some illness happen right before they develop the diabetes. But it doesn't seem to be a particular illness. You know, all of the viruses have been blamed at one point or another, but there hasn't been a single one that has been proven to be the one that does it. It's something triggers that, you know, autoimmune disaster to develop in someone who may have a little bit of a genetic tendency to begin with. And your other question was, I'm sorry. Oh, brittle. Um, I think we still use it, and I think we use it a little too much. There are some patients who are very difficult to control, which is what brittle basically means. You know, your sugars are here, they're, they're here, and then they're here. I find it that, in, unfortunately, a lot of patients, the brittleness is self-induced. Not on purpose, not that they're doing it on purpose. Sometimes they may, but uh, not on purpose, but by mistakenly overreacting to things. They have a hypoglycemic episode, their sugar goes down, and they, they get so scared of it that they overcorrect, and then they're 400, and then they get scared of that, so they shoot all kinds of insulin, and next thing they know, they're 22. So those can be easily managed by just a lot of, you know, just hand-holding and those are the patients that benefit greatly by sending their blood sugars in frequently to the office. They feel like they have some back, you know, somebody's holding their back in case they have a problem. However, there, there are some patients who are very unpredictable. Uh, and we see that even in the hospital. You have them under very controlled situation. They get the diet that they have to get, unless some relative is, you know, sneaking them food, which can happen. Uh, you know, the nurses are giving them the insulin, they're not missing any doses, and they're still unpredictably um, high or low. They tend to be long-term diabetics. They have had diabetes for a long time. They tend to already have some kidney problems, and that makes their insulin reaction unpredictable. The old insulin, and, and a lot of the brittle term came from the old days when they used beef pork insulin. And people develop antibodies against those insulins because they had a lot of foreign protein that did not belong in a human being. And those antibodies sort of attached to the insulin and it's a circulated attached to antibodies for a while and suddenly released and they got this burst of insulin for no reason. So it was a very big problem back, you know, when they had um, beef pork insulin. It's not so much with the human insulins. Aside from genetics, um, since there is a very high risk factor uh, associated with very obese persons, why is it that, or what, what causes some obese people to go their whole life and never develop diabetes, and a thin person who actually doesn't eat improperly 
gets mm -hmm. it. And, and that's, that's where the genetics come into place. Uh, well, there is not much outside from generic that, genetics that does that. That's the whole point. Um, the reason why some, uh, to develop diabetes with weight issues, you have to, weight problems cause insulin resistance. And that's true for even the ones who don't have diabetes. If you measure their insulin levels, they're higher than normal. They have to overwork their pancreas to keep their sugars under control and not become diabetics. The argument could be, well, if they live long enough, they may develop it. However, let's assume they don't. That means they have a pancreas that is so good that they can keep pouring insulin by the bucket full and they never run out of um, supply. If you add to the weight issue that is causing them the, the insulin resistance, a little bit of genetic tendency, and a very sedentary lifestyle, you just cross the point of no return there and they become diabetics. The thin people tend to be either, you know, they're type 1s and that's, like I said, an autoimmune response, or they can be type 2s who have a very strong genetics, or they can be the late onset um, diabetes of the young, which is sort of a type 1 and a half or type 2 and a quarter or whatever you want to call them. They sort of behave a little bit of this and a little bit of that. They're thin people who really have type 2 diabetes who respond to pills. And they're sometimes mistaken for type 1s. And they're stuck on insulin uh, without really investigating it a little bit further. Is that a huge issue? No, because insulin does not hurt anybody. It's the safe, if you're not sure what type of diabetic you're treating, treat, treat them with insulin. It's the safest thing to do. You cannot ever go wrong with insulin. I think that was some of the same question that I had with the uh, type 2 adolescent diabetic. How do you determine that it is just from the weight gain? Again, I mean, obviously, they have to be overweight or obese to qualify as type 2 adolescents. Uh, they could be those late um, maturity onset diabetes of the young, although they usually start a little later, you know, 20s. Um, family history, strong family history. One other thing that we're seeing is, you know, diabetes is so prevalent. There's so many people with diabetic history in the family. And you have, you know, John who has grandma, mom, Uncle Joe has diabetes. Mary, Mary who has mom, dad, Uncle John, and Uncle Bill have diabetes. And their children have a humongous genetic uh, load. And they develop it a lot younger. So getting a good history from the entire family is important. And sometimes, you know, and doesn't apply, unfortunately, for a, well, it does. When a physician asks you the family history, does anybody in your family have diabetes? The dead people count. <laughs> Just because grandma's been dead for 45 years, it doesn't mean she never had diabetes. And I can't believe how many of my patients don't think that's important. You know, no, no, no one has diabetes in my family. None of my children or grandchildren. Well, what about your parents or grandparents? Oh, yeah, but they're dead. <laughs> Please tell us that. You know, you need to tell us. The dead people count. So, you know, you, sometimes as a physician or as a nurse or a healthcare provider, we need to be more specific with our questions. You know, did your mother have diabetes? Did your father have diabetes? Any of your grandparents, any of your aunts and uncles? Don't just throw, did anybody in the family have diabetes? It has to be very specific. Um, and also, again, we go back to the borderline thing. Sometimes people think as long as people don't take insulin, they don't really have true diabetes. It's just a touch of sugar. So that doesn't count. Well, all, you know, it does count. So a, again, I think a lot of the time is almost 100% is genetic, and the other 100% is lousy lifestyle. Um, when you look in history, and I love history, I, if I had not been a physician, I would be a historian, but if you look back in history, you can parallel the rise and fall of diabetes according to um, economic times. During the Great Depression, the incidence of diabetes went down. Why was that? People couldn't afford a lot of food. You didn't see a lot of obese people in the depression. Not that I live there, I'm not that old. But you know, if you look at, you know, historically, you do not see a lot. When did the current epidemic start? In the late 1950s, when all the food, fast food places came about. And it really spiraled in the 80s when the video games came out. 
and you had all the kids sitting in there with their french fries and their potato chips and the controller for the Nintendo or whatever. Um, it's, it's just amazing. I mean, you can just tell by during World War II in Europe, new cases of diabetes practically disappeared. Again, nobody had food. People were eating their cats. You know, you don't really uh, you don't really have enough food available to develop the overweight diabetes. So, uh, I have a question. Where are you? Uh, most I'm right back here, oh. <laughs> all the way back here. Um, type two diabetes is mostly controlled with oral medications. What criteria do you use with type two diabetes to use insulin? Not being controlled with oral medications. Uh, now you can control. Now let me let me kind of ex expand on that. If again you have to set your goal, let's assume your goal is because of whatever age or whatever is less than seven for your hemoglobin A1C. So you start with one pill, usually metformin, and you go for three months. Your A1C is at goal. You're fine. Your A1C is not at goal. It's eight. Well, you add another pill. You go another three four months. Your A1C is not at goal. Is still over eight. At that point, you have two choices. You can go straight to insulin at that point, in addition to the pills, or you can try a third oral agent. Going beyond three oral agents is a total waste of time. Sometimes going beyond two, if your A1C is nine, is a waste of time. Going, if your A1C is nine, and you're on two pills, let's say metformin and glipicide or glimepiride, and you add a third pill, your A1C is likely to come down anywhere between 0.5 and 0.8. So if you're at nine, you cannot get to seven adding a third pill. If you are at 7.5 and you want to get to less than five, then that's a good case for the third pill. But again, at, by the time you hit two pills and your A1C is still not what it should be, your choices are depending on how bad the A1C is, either adding a third pill or going on insulin. And you don't want to wait 10 years to do that. That's the whole point. So it, what determines basically is, in a nutshell, how your A1C is, are you at goal, are you trending towards goal? Now, I have seen people, you know, at diagnosis, their A1C is 14. It's awful. And you check them again in four months on two pills because one is not going to get you there. You start with two already, and they are 8.2. Now, that's not at goal, but you went from 14 to 8.2 in four months. The trend is so good, you sit it out. You wait another four or five months, and you check it again, and they're probably at goal at that point. So again, it's, it has to be individualized a little bit, and a lot of it depends on how high your hemoglobin A1C is and what other medical conditions you have, obviously. Thank you. You're welcome. One last question. Two-part question. Uh, what are some of the uh, side effects of taking metformin? And given those, whatever those may be, as along with what you said about long-term use of metformin, what's a common alternative to using that? The, the two most common ones by far are nausea and diarrhea. And diarrhea is probably the biggest one. Um, it is less problematic with the extended release forms like metformin ER. Uh, it was a problem when you know we had the metformin first came out as, as a generic from glucophage. We have glucophage XR as a brand and then plain metformin as a generic and people will switch from glu glucophage XR to metformin and have diarrhea like crazy. If you look at the overall, if you have 100 patients on metformin, probably only about six of them, about 6% will not be able to tolerate it due to diarrhea. Majority of people get just a little loose bowel movements for a few days and they stick with it and it, it settles, it goes away. The nausea, if you take it with food, is usually not a problem at all. Other weird side effects, again, I mean, the, the serious one is the lactic acidosis if the kidney function is not well uh, monitor. Um, that's why when you have diabetes and you're on metformin, having a blood sugar and an A1C done only as a checkup is not sufficient. You have to have a metabolic panel done with your kidney function and your liver function. Metformin works mainly at the liver, helping the body utilize the glucose better. 
So you want to make sure the liver functions are normal also. But you know, in rare side effects, you know, people have allergic reactions, have rashes, have headaches, weird things. But the very, very common one is diarrhea and nausea. And the serious, serious one is lactic acidosis. Someone with congestive heart failure that is not well controlled is not a good candidate for metformin because of concern of lactic acidosis. Your kidney function can do this with the heart not functioning properly. People with COPD who are on oxygen, I'm a little leery because lack of oxygen can cause lactic acidosis and you add metformin to that and it's a little bit tricky. Long term, again, I mean, there are no studies, and you have to remember, metformin has been available in Europe since the 1970s. It's been available in the United States since 1995, but it was available in Europe since the 70s. So there are very, very long-term studies. There are no long-term concerns with metformin. There are no you know, problems that develop later on. But you know, the, the, I used to tell people, you're going to be on metformin forever, and then it's, you know, that's not a good, a, a good phrase, to be honest with you, because you're going to be on metformin until 80, and then we'll talk about it. <laughs> it's a better way to say it. People, fortunately, are living beyond 80 by a long shot. So we have to start saying, you know, until 80, and then we'll talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your attention. I appreciate it. <laughs>